Okay, let me also double check. Okay. There you go. All right. So let me just spend like two minutes quickly. <coughs> All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, sorry for the technical delay. And for those people who fortunately join, uh, welcome here. For, for those people who know, some people may not be able to join, you may forward the, the new meeting room number to them. Okay, so let me uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to uh, Harvard CMSA Center of Math, Medical Science and Application uh, Seminar Series on Quantum Math. Uh, today we are very honored Professor Frank Wilcher uh, to uh, tell me a story, a new adventure he has about physical approach to quantum computing. Uh, before we uh, guess, uh, I think uh, Frank is one of the most uh, favorite physicists I admire, so I'm gonna get a chance to hear uh, here. So uh, Frank, in uh, 1976 or 74, sorry, 74, uh, he wrote a thesis on uh, non theory theory. Uh, and uh, this is just the very beginning of his physics journey, journey and then uh, when he made uh, a trip to Stockholm with this uh, beautiful diploma. And when I was a grad student at MIT, taking his class he was on AA71 and AA72 on advanced topics of physics, Quantum field theory, supergravity, topological geometry basis, and I had a chance to chat with him. Uh, once I told him that I'm reading some classic paper he had written, a uh, PIL paper, and Frank uh, replied, said that, oh, there are many such papers. Which one are you reading? And it is true that he has written a uh, more than 83 uh, classic PIL paper. And, uh, I would love to say something that uh, you'd be no, no time for me, but I want to uh, say a few things. Uh, working on diverse topics almost at the same time on um, uh, the, the precursor for the action on the strong PT invariance in the presence of incentome, uh, and uh, also together with the work on Smyberg, uh, up here about the same time. But uh, almost around that time, he already uh, thinking about fraction statistic particle now known. I think today he will talk about. And this is the foundation of the work. I think many people on topological phase matter are highly rely on this kind of concepts. And these are just in the 80s. But uh, you may think these are already more than enough, but he also written uh, several uh, books, such as this one, a review and uh, 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 the print, fractional statistic, and uh, connectivity. Uh, furthermore, even just around 1980, he was thinking about a wider variety of topics, such as the uh, introduced the uh, barrier minus lepton number being in standard model and also SU5 granular location. And that's about the same time he's thinking about aliens. And then he also writes, there's a written paper on this 18 granular locations around 82, and not to mention other topics on quantum dynamics property. Okay, so, and in the 90s, uh, he continued to thinking about exotic phase in QCD, such as a QCD uh, phase diagram in the finite density in condition at low temperature. He introduced color fiber locking in uh, QCD superconductivity phase, and then also uh, hypothesized the possibility of a quark hydron continuity in low temperature, and it's also still an ongoing pro uh, research today. But in 2012, he introduced quantum time crystal and took uh, people several years till 2018 improve and understand better and several experimental groups to verify such a new piece of matter can exist. Oh, so there are too many things I can read. Let me just finally say something. In the popular books, Frank Welch has written those benefits for uh, popularize the scientific notions of topics to general publics. We already have the great honor to have a, a Professor Frank Welchek telling us a story about physical quantum computing. 
So let's welcome Frank. So, uh, Frank, um, share the screen and I will. Thank you very much. Um, okay, can can uh, can everyone hear me and see me, or hear see my screen, the blank screen? Okay. Uh, let me know in the chat if you're having difficulties. I sincerely apologize for the uh, technical delay. It was very mysterious. I had lots of experience with Zoom by now, and uh, never anything like this. It just wouldn't accept the password. So we had to change uh, sites. But uh, okay, so the, that's half an hour of your life and my life that we'll never get back, but we will <laughs> try to make uh, the best of it. I think there is uh, some interesting stuff coming your way now. <clears throat> So I'm going to talk about some physical methods for quantum computing. The bulk of the talk will be about uh, some uh, rather recent work, which has not yet, I would think it's fair to say, entered the mainstream, but which I have high hopes for. But before getting into that, I want to mention some recent developments that are related to uh, physical methods of quantum computing that uh, are really uh, undergoing spectacular development and uh, uh, where, the, where there have been recent absolutely beautiful and decisive uh, experiments. <clears throat> so this is about any odds. Uh, I won't be giving a full scale seminar or colloquium about any odds but just to uh, talk about the relationship to quantum computing, anions are particles that have a kind of memory. They keep track of uh, how they wind around each other, or actually I think we should say their wave function keeps track of how they have wound around each other. And so uh, you get a mapping of braiding, braids or knots into, uh, movement in Hilbert space. And since braids can get very, very complicated, uh, this can be used very powerfully in computing. It also has the advantage of noise immunity because the mapping only depends on the topology of the braids. Uh, small uh, jiggles like this noise shown here uh, do not affect the results. And that, since uh, errors in quantum computing uh, can be very upsetting, the, the, the computational process is very delicate, uh, this kind of noise immunity could be very, very valuable. Uh, as a theoretical concept, Enions have been around for almost 40 years. The name dates to 1982 when I introduced it. Uh, the concepts go back even a little further. Uh, but until this uh, April, there's been no experimental, no direct experimental confirmation, although there have been, I think, thousands of papers on the subject by now, in, in theory. And it's been very, very highly developed. And one has many, many materials whose quasi-particles are meant to be anions. Uh, the direct experimental evidence really hasn't been there until uh, two recent experiments. This one uh, was the first experiment that showed uh, that the statistics of quasi-particles in the new equals a third quantum Hall state, so exactly the state that uh, uh, Arovis and Schrieffer and I first proved the uh, uh, or pre got concrete predictions for the behavior, uh, these 
uh, that their behavior in collisions was not consistent with either bosons or fermions, but seemed to be something in between. And actually there were uh, theoretical models that uh, did a pretty good quantitative job of accounting for what they saw in, uh, in terms of uh, the statistics of the colliding quasi-particles. But uh, what's absolutely clear, independent of detailed models, because you can work it out for bosons and fermions, is that it wasn't either of those. <clears throat> uh, then, uh, the more recent experiment by the uh, Purdue group that, as far as I know, is not yet published, it, uh, but I'm sure it surely will be, was uh, direct evidence for the braiding <clears throat> and uh, the, the accumulation of phase as one quasi-particle circles around another accumulation of phase um, as predicted in that old paper. Uh, and the setup is uh, this kind of uh, sem uh, arrangement of leads on the surface of a semiconductor, which is in the new equals the third state. And uh, as you crank up the magnetic field, uh, the, uh, the, according to the theory, the fluid inside is incompressible, but can admit discrete vortices and each, and the vortices are anions, and each time a vortex comes in, you see a jump in the interference pattern, which represents the effect that the phase of a, another quasi-particle going around, uh, according to either of the two alternative loops, uh, the paths uh, sketched here will interfere in a different way. And this is what they saw. Absolutely gorgeous uh, quantitative confirmation of the existence and the size of the jumps. A key to this experiment, which makes me very optimistic about future developments, uh, is that to get the behavior to stand out clearly, the reason it's taken so long is that the materials are uh, very, very challenging uh, to work with. They're two-dimensional, high magnetic field, low, low, a very low temperature, you have to have a no, uh, as, as little impurities as possible. But even then, uh, after all, you're dealing with electrons and there are uh, electrical forces as well as the subtle statistical forces, and you have to try to minimize the effect of all that. And what they did, that was a, a, a really powerful new innovation uh, in their experiment, was pay extremely careful attention to screening the ordinary charge interactions. Uh, the good news here is that they just, uh, this, is re this is reproducible. This, is, this strategy, which is now shown to work, uh, is a general strategy. And so uh, I anticipate that there'll be many, many more experiments enabled by using this technique that will look at other fractions, perhaps uh, for experts, also non-abelian uh, states. And uh, this was uh, a very uh, exciting uh, set of developments to anticipate. Uh, there's also a whole nother field with anions being engineered that's also promising. It hasn't quite broken through yet, but uh, Microsoft has invest, is investing a lot of money in it and they're very able people working on it. So I anticipate there too, uh, we'll be hearing good news soon. <clears throat> okay, so that was the uh, 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 somewhat self-indulgent, but I think uh, uh, you know every 40 years or so, we should allow ourselves a little liberty uh, account of uh, what's going on in anions. Now I'd like to return to the subject of the seminar proper, which is uh, uh, physical methods of uh, quantum computing. Uh, and the theme here will be we're going to look at uh, methods that uh, are not easily captured in the standard circuit model 
of quantum computing, that kind of abstraction and idealization. And yet that seemed to offer additional resources and uh, maybe should be thought about uh, uh, more deeply. <clears throat> so I will first, since uh, this, I was told is gonna be a mixed audience in many senses, I will first review uh, the computer science problems that I'm going to be uh, addressing uh, briefly. These are the Grover problem, the independent sets problem, and the satisfaction problem. I'll show how each of these can be encoded in Hamiltonians and therefore be made into physics problems. <clears throat> uh, and then I will talk about three physical ideas that will be applied to these problems. Uh, the idea of exploiting residence, resonance and uh, something I call monitor bits, which are natural to use in the context of resonance. Uh, Non-abelian holonomy, also known as uh, uh, geometric phase or Berry, Berry phase generalized uh, to uh, multi-level systems. And finally, uh, cooling. Maybe I should have said, I should say careful cooling that can be uh, an important, I think an important adjunct to uh, quantum computing. Okay, so uh, first I'll talk about encoding problems in Hamiltonians, starting with the Grover problem. In the simplest version of the Grover problem, we're given a list of N items and we must find one marked mystery item. So it's a very, common problem, of course, in applications of computing to look through lists and find something. Uh, now, in, uh, in the literature of quantum computing, this is, a, this is one of the classics because it's one of the few natural problems in which it's been demonstrated uh, analytically that quantum computing offers a, a uh, parametric advantage over classical computing for large lists. Uh, it's one of the classics of quantum computing that there's an algorithm called Grover's algorithm that can solve this problem in a time proportional to square root of n. Whereas classically, obviously, or semi-obviously, you really can't do better than just looking uh, item by item and that's of order n. <clears throat> Now, in a generalization of the Grover algorithm, which we'll uh, be heading towards, uh, we can have k-marked items instead of one. Or we, we either know or don't know k in advance, and uh, we might want to find all of them or one of them or some of them, and there are very different variants on this problem, obviously. <clears throat> and uh, just keep that in mind. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, narrow it down. Uh, in, the, in the discussion of actual algorithms. Uh, in general, uh, we can code this in terms of a physical problem of finding the ground state of a Hamiltonian, uh, the Hamiltonian being what's called the oracle. So you imagine a device whose Hamiltonian uh, is centered uh, or, or picks out the mystery item, the, uh, the unknown marked entry of the list, and uh, makes it the grounds, makes finding that entry, uh, finding the ground state uh, is equivalent to finding the entry in the list. And uh, here and throughout, I'll use binary notation for qubits. So qubits are either up or down. Uh, I mean, think of, well, think of spins, but it could also, there are many other uh, possibilities, and uh, and I'll, I'll also assume the standard encoding for binary encoding of numbers. In 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 uh, when I so when I refer to a state X, which is the uh, mth state in the list, uh, that corresponds to a certain configuration of spins, which represents the integer X in binary. <clears throat> Uh, and the variant problem is uh, also given by an oracle, but now we have uh, several states that are the mystery states. 
So that's the Grover problem. Another classic problem is, uh, I want to get rid of this bar here, okay. Another classic problem is uh, make maximal and maximum independent sets. And in this problem, uh, we're given a set of n nodes. So in a computer, it's n addresses, but we can think it's useful to think of it as n nodes and some connections uh, between the pairs of nodes. So it can be visualized as a graph with links. And the problem is to find large independent, that is link free sets of nodes. So you want to find sets of nodes such that uh, none of them are connected by, by the links. Uh, one is to find the, the, the sloppiest version is to find uh, large independent sets. Uh, another is to find independent sets that are maximal. So if you add even one more node, uh, it's no longer possible for them to be independent. And then finally, the most challenging is to find a maximum independent set. That's, that is a maximal independent set with the largest number of nodes. These problems have wildly different degrees of difficulty uh, as we'll discuss in more depth later. <clears throat> but here's just to nail down the concepts. So uh, we have uh, nodes here, X1 through X6. And so the X's wouldn't have to be there. You could just label them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, and uh, here I've, uh, I've uh, trespassed on my uh, uh, previous statement that I'd be using addresses, but I hope, I hope the meaning is clear. There's just uh, uh, the, uh, if you choose the round nodes here, so that's one, three, six, uh, they are independent. There's no link between those nodes. And that's not entirely trivial uh, compared to the fact that you always have, even without looking at the graph, you'd know that uh, the, no the empty set of nodes is an independent set and any one node is an independent set. Uh, this, this indicated set with the open circles is not maximal. Uh, you can add X4 to it and then it uh, becomes maximal. Uh, I see I forgot to, oh, you should add X4 to it. I didn't in the, in the slide, uh, but even that's not maximum. Uh, the maximum independent set uh, has five entries. Actually, there are two of them, and I've displayed one of them here. You take uh, X1, X3, X4, X5, and X7, and no two of them are connected by a link. And you can convince yourself without too much difficulty, I think, that that's as big a maximum, uh, an independent set as there is. <clears throat> we can encode graph structure also in a simple Hamiltonian. Uh, we, of course, encode the nodes as numbers, and at each one we have a uh, spin or qubit that can be down or up. Uh, if it's if the node is uh, in the in, is in the independent set, we take a one. Otherwise, we take minus one. So the candidate independent sets are mapped onto which spins point up. Uh, and then the Hamiltonian, which encodes the graph structure, is simply that for each time each time you have a link between x i and x j you add uh, this particular uh, link, linking Hamiltonian, and you can see that its property is that it's zero if either of them is uh, spin down, so if either of them is not in the set, but it's a four delta if both of them are in the set. So if you have a link that involves two nodes that are in the set, 
you pay an energetic penalty of four delta. And so uh, if you add up all the links that are in your graph, uh, then the uh, independent set problem is uh, exploring the ground state of this Hamiltonian. That is, a set is an independent set if and only if it has zero energy according to this Hamiltonian. Okay, finally, the other problem that I want to refer to is satisfaction. In this problem, one is given a set of assertions, uh, f disjunctions formally that, uh, well, I'll give an example, give, give examples momentarily, but they're basically or statements and one attempts to satisfy them all simultaneously. So you have a bunch of phrases that are or statements and then all of those appear in one gigantic end state and statement. So typical phrases are, we allow uh, negations, by the way. Uh, so uh, typical phrases would be not x1 or not x2. So that one is uh, true, is correct if either x1 or x2 is, uh, is false. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, uh, a three component statement would be x3 is true or x4 is false or x5 is false. This too can be mapped in uh, following a very similar strategy uh, to the, that is this satisfaction problem can be uh, addressed using the same strategy of opposing penalties for each unsatisfied phrase and the penalty clauses that would have, the penalty Hamiltonians that would apply to these two phrases, for example, are uh, the same kind of thing we saw before, delta times one plus sigma one z, one plus sigma two z. Uh, this is where you're mapping spin down onto false and spin up onto true. Or for the second phrase, uh, uh, a very similar thing, but now with a minus sign because X3 appears as a positive assertion as opposed to a negation. And you just add them all up. And again, the uh, statement that uh, a given choice of assignments of true or false to all the variables uh, sat satisfies the problem that is satisfies all the phrases is that uh, it has zero energy. So it escapes all the penalties. Uh, from a physical point of view, it's notable that three sat but not two sat. So three sat is, is the version of the problem in which all the phrases have three components. And if you look back, when they have three components, you're bringing in three body interactions. Whereas if they only have two components, you have only two body interactions. <clears throat> so the, as we know in physics, things get a lot more complicated when you have three body interactions uh, and that's gonna be reflected in this problem. Uh, the paradigm problem, the thing that's usually called the satisfaction uh, full stop in the, in the literature is to find an assignment that satisfies all the disjunctions, so a zero energy state, or to show that no such thing is possible. So this is a problem that has a yes or no answer. Uh, well, if you, if you know how to answer, if, let's, if the yes or no version of this would be called satisfaction decision, and it differs trivially from this one. Uh, and so satisfaction decision simply asks whether there is a zero energy state. So it has a very simple physical meaning. Uh, and it turns out that two sat is easy. There are, uh, I think, linear in time algorithms or most quadratic in the size of the problem, size of the phrase of the uh, problem. <laughs> and uh, 
but 3SAT is one of these problems that's NP complete, that you can map many, many uh, problems onto that are all thought to be very difficult. And there's no known polynomial algorithm <clears throat> that addresses any of them. And you can map any one of them and onto any other in polynomial time. So this forms a natural class of uh, very difficult problems. <clears throat> Uh, as you might have uh, put together, if you were thinking quickly, uh, the two set, the independent sets can be phrased in the two set, two set framework with all negations. I'll leave that as an exercise if you haven't figured it out already. Uh, I mentioned that uh, satisfaction decision is an NP complete problem. You can map all kinds of important problems onto it. But maybe it's just to make, uh, but many problems, well, you might, be, you might be a little more modest and say, well, I'd be satisfied with, with uh, uh, satisfying all the phrases except a small number in some sense. So satisfy a lot of them. Uh, and that can be of great interest uh, because many optimization problems can be mapped onto 3SAT or phrased directly as finding low energy, finding the lowest energy state, uh, but you might be satisfied uh, to find a pretty good solution. So a near optimal solution. Okay, so those are the kinds of problems that uh, can be mapped very naturally onto natural physical problems involving deceptively simple uh, in, uh, interacting spins with at most three body interactions. <clears throat> uh, so let me very quickly review a classic quantum approach to the Grover algorithm that's uh, different from Grover's original approach, but uh, is a natural lead in to the uh, new technique that I wanted to show you. <clears throat> so uh, an informative approach to the Grover problem exploits the adiabatic theorem of quantum mechanics, which basically says that if you make slow, if you will make, make slow ch changes in the Hamiltonian, uh, there are no quantum jumps. So if you have uh, levels spaced by a gap, uh, and you're, you're, you're the, the levels that you're interested in, the state of the system is in a level separated by other levels from a by a gap, uh, it'll stay as you slowly evolve the Hamiltonian, as long as the gap doesn't collapse, uh, you'll stay in that ground state. <clears throat> uh, slow quantitatively here, means that the time scale for energy variation must be large compared to the inverse of the energy gap, which is time dependent because you're changing the Hamiltonian as a function of time. Okay. Uh, in many applications of quantum computing, uh, you, before you know the answer, you want to get, have every state uh, get its equal uh, every candidate answer get uh, considered. And so uh, you prepare this state S and this can be prepared uh, conveniently using local gates. Uh, that's uh, an equal mixture of all the possible uh, states with relative coefficients one. And then uh, we, uh, use in the adiabatic approach uh, this combination of the oracle Hamiltonian, where I've taken delta to be one for simplicity of notation, and uh, the uh, state Hamiltonian SS. And you start at time zero with the state Hamiltonian, where you know how to prepare the ground state, and then you slowly bring in the oracle Hamiltonian until at time t equals capital T, uh, the Hamiltonian has changed into the answer Hamiltonian. 
remember you didn't know what x was to begin with but the oracle did and so uh, if, if you can uh, get your system into the eigenstate x you will have identified what x is so uh, that's the strategy of adiabatic quantum computing. You start with the ground state, you end with the ground state of another Hamiltonian and trust in the adiabatic theorem to say that there were no jumps. Now, uh, this setup is very simple to analyze because everything is, all the cards are on the table. You know what S is, you know what X is, you know what the Hamiltonian is and uh, uh, it essentially reduces to a two-state problem uh, because uh, you never get out of the space spanned by S and X. And uh, it's convenient to analyze it in a basis, which is X itself and the orthogonal complement of X. And then if you work in that space, the Hamiltonian looks like this. So it becomes essentially a two, two state system. Uh, and you see that at the, the halfway through the process, uh, the gap narrows, essentially the diagonal terms become equal and uh, and the off diagonal terms are small of order square root of n. So the gap narrows to uh, square root of n. And then the slowness condition requires that you take your time when the, when the gap gets small. And this explains, if you like, in a nice physical way, why using quantum mechanics, you can get to square root of n, but makes it plausible you can't get any further. <clears throat> So uh, the adiabatic method has been proposed and used for several different problems, uh, but there's another more flexible approach that's also used for many problems uh, in which you want to not just focus on the ground state, but focus on a particular energy difference or a particular set of energy difference, differences. And then you can exploit resonance. So we asked ourselves whether it's possible to apply ideas of resonance to this test problem. <clears throat> uh, let me remind you very quickly uh, of the basic resonance phenomenon. In the context of a two-level system, uh, we have uh, a system that uh, has two states separated by energy delta, and we apply a very small but time-dependent uh, interaction that connects them. And then if uh, we apply it with the right frequency so that it has the right energy quantum mechanically to connect uh, the two levels, uh, it can be very effective in inducing transitions. And uh, in view of the time, I won't belabor this, but just to say that if you apply uh, your perturbation on resonance, you can work it out analytically what happens uh, and uh, oops. Uh, you find that at a, a very specific time uh, the, the uh, spin has flipped or the level has flipped from one to the other completely. So if you know delta in advance uh, and apply a perturbation of known strength, uh, you just have to wait the appropriate amount of time and there you are. <clears throat> uh, this can be understood in a rotating frame nicely. Uh, if you uh, go to a rotating frame in the sense of supplying phase to the states that compensates for the Schrodinger equation phase, it, uh, uh, the diagonal effects, the diagonal entries aren't affected except by a constant, which makes them all equal because you've taken out the energy term, so to speak. 
the off-diagonal terms are affected. However, if they already have frequency dependence, you get rid of it. And so the frequent, or you modify it. And if you have an R on resonance, you get rid of it. And you're left with, in the rotating frame, a uh, static Hamiltonian that works. And if, it, if that, that has uh, off, only off-diagonal terms and, uh, and can induce the transition in a nice predictable way. Now, uh, if we use our two Hamiltonians, the oracle and the state, in a very particular, in, uh, in general, with time-dependent coefficients, and I'm sorry, these should all be taus or all t's, but I mixed up. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Hamiltonian is of this type, and if you and notice that the fact that x has small overlap with s is reflected directly in the smallness of the off diagonal terms that's because it's one out of n states and the normalization is one over square root of n so very very clear physical origin of this uh, one over square root of n and if you choose this particular time dependence for the different uh, uh, Hamiltonians, then this maps onto a Hamiltonian of the resonance type. Uh, this looks more complicated than it is. Notice that in the matrix, it's the combination, uh, combinations A plus C and A plus B, I'm, I'm sorry, and B plus C that appear. on the diagonal. So the oscillating terms will cancel. All the oscillations are off diagonal and it becomes exactly of the resonance form. <clears throat> and again, we read off from the standard resonance analysis. We have a, a flip at a definite time. The fact that it's a very, def that occurs at a definite time uh, will be very useful in, uh, I think in many applications, but in particular uh, in an application I'm not about to mention. In the uh, generalized Grover algorithm, basically the strength of the interaction term is bigger when you do this mapping because uh, instead of having uh, one state, the oracle is mapping onto a combination of K states and so uh, the, the coefficient instead of being n is also has a, a k in it. Instead of being one over the square root of n also has a k in, a square root of k in it and uh, and therefore things happen faster. <clears throat> uh, monitor qubits are an innovation. They keep track of whether a resonant flip has occurred. Uh, therefore they can keep track of the progress of a calculation without uh, necessitating measurement on the computational bits. So many times in quantum computing, you want to monitor the state of a calculation without uh, making a measurement, because if you make a measurement, roughly speaking, you collapse the wave function and you, just, you certainly disturb the computational process and you, know, you don't want to do that. <clears throat> And uh, here uh, we add a spin, sigma x, uh, to the second, second component here is gonna be the monitor bit. And uh, you can convince yourself that on resonance, uh, the Hamilton, the uh, evolution effectively becomes uh, a common evolution of the monitor bit and the computational bit. And so the monitor bit flips under the same resonance condition at the same time as the computational bit. If you're off resonance, then it won't flip uh, reliably either. <clears throat> so this extra, this extra information can be used in various ways in different versions of the generalized Grover problem. Uh, 
especially in view of the time, I won't go into to those details, but the most powerful uh, technique, I think, which it really uses physics, uh, that is uh, we want to make the readout robust. Uh, so the monitor bit just doesn't, it doesn't have to be a single bit. We can make many of them. Uh, and if we make enough of them, they generate a magnetic field and we can monitor that field to see how the monitor bits have been doing. And that tells us very valuable information. For instance, if we want to determine K, remember the time of flipping uh, was dependent on K and uh, this, this using the monitor bits, uh, you can measure uh, when the flipping has occurs and that gives you, uh, because that's when you get the biggest magnetic field in the appropriate direction. And uh, this turns out to be uh, qualitatively superior to all known alternatives for determining K. As you might imagine, we brought, we've changed the rules of the game, bringing in extra resources. And if we don't account for the cost of those resources, uh, we can do better than uh, standard models. But, uh, but this is a very concrete uh, example of that. Okay, so resonance and monitor bits were uh, the, the uh, first kind of innovation that I wanted to discuss. The next is uh, non-abelian holonomy also known as uh, generalized adiabatic theorem or uh, geometric phase or Berry phase uh, or, or just holonomy in, in different uh, parts of the literature. Uh, it's, uh, it, it involves a generalized understanding of the adiabatic theorem, which is that uh, if you have degenerate levels uh, that are separated by a gap from other levels, then uh, the evolution will still have no quantum jumps, but there can be non-trivial motion within the uh, degenerate levels. In fact, And uh, that gives us an emergent gauge field or alternatively an emergent Hamiltonian. Because if you put it into an equation, uh, we get unitary evolution, which in fact is purely geometrically determined by the shape of the degenerate manifolds in Hilbert space, how they're embedded in Hilbert space. This picture is a little misleading because the manifolds are always uh, straight lines, but they're embedded in different directions in Hilbert space. So they should be hyperplanes, but never mind. Uh, the, the spirit is correct. You get uh, an, uh, an evolution, which is uh, a non-abelian unitary transformation in general. Uh, and that can be written as a time ordered exponential that tells you how the phase accumulates, where the uh, gauge field is a very explicit function of the geometry of the eigenspaces as it changes in time. So in the independent set problem, remember all the independent sets were ground states, but uh, many of them were trivial. We would, and finding trivial ground states is not a heroic accomplishment. We would like to find ground states that are complicated, that have many more nodes. Uh, and here is uh, a way to do that uh, using the non-abelian holonomy. So we have this manifold of degenerate states that uh, we'd like to move around in and move off the trivial states into the non-trivial states. And we can do that by making an appropriate set of motions of 
uh, changing the Hamiltonian uh, in such a way that we keep this degenerate space degenerate, uh, but uh, move it around in Hilbert space. And that can be done again by simple operations, which are, uh, well, to say they're easily embodied in physical systems would be an overstatement, but are conceivably embodied in physical systems. Basically, they're rotations and uh, in cleverly designed directions. So they induce a gauge field, which you can compute. This gauge field changes one entry at a time, uh, basically because that unitary transformation was acting on each spin separately. Uh, but since it gets exponentiated and acts over time, uh, you can move in a versatile way through the, the manifold in this way. And, uh, and you get from trivial, starting from trivial states, you get uh, non-trivial states. And in that paper that was uh, quoted in passing, you can see some of the numerical work that shows uh, that, that it, uh, it works surprisingly well. <clears throat> perhaps surprisingly well. Uh, I wanted now, we, in re very recent work, we've taken it a step further, which I think is much, much more exciting than the first step. Uh, so uh, here's what this, the uh, gauge field looks like analytically. And now I want to take the adiabatic theorem even one step further <laughs> by uh, saying that if, if you have a small spread in states that is that are separated by a much larger gap from other states uh, and move slowly but not necessarily very slowly, you can induce motion within that uh, space uh, without having to worry about the, the far separated states. So this is a form of uh, I guess in, in particle physics, you would call this a form of decoupling theorem that the heavy, uh, the heavy degrees of freedom cancel out. Heavy in this mean, just means that there's a large energy gap that can be ignored. Uh, so here's what the gauge field or effective Hamiltonian looks like. And the crucial thing to notice is that at theta, so where n plus is the number of upspins, so it's the number of non-trivial uh, nodes, nodes that are within the independent set. And the crucial thing to notice is that at theta equals zero, if you have some motion so that there is a dependence of the energy on uh, this, if you're moving in, the, in such a way as to increase the angle phi, as you approach theta equals zero, the ground state is the state, is the maximal, the maximum independent state, in fact. So the low energy states will be the states that have uh, the largest number of upspins. Uh, wait, I said theta equals zero, I meant theta equals uh, pi. At theta equals pi, uh, you'll have the most spins, most upspins. Whereas at theta equals zero, uh, it's just the opposite. Well, at, at, at theta equals zero, uh, it's fine to have uh, uh, the, the, the n plus, it's, it, the, the ground state is uh, one of the trivial uh, state. The true ground state is one of the trivial states. <clears throat> now, uh, I promised to mention that independent sets can have very wildly different degrees of difficulty to find an independent set is totally trivial because there are trivial independent sets. To find a non-trivial set, you may have to work through the whole bunch of nodes, so that's sort of N. To find a maximal independent set, there are, cle there are clever algorithms that do that in order M plus N, where M is the number of links. Uh, and on the other hand, to determine whether there is an independent set of a size K is NP complete and to find the maximum independent set is even harder. That's something called NP hard, which means it's uh, NP complete for sure, but it's not known that uh, if you could solve 
other NP complete problems, you would necessarily be able to solve this one. <clears throat> so it's even harder potentially than, uh, than the NP complete problems. Okay, so, uh, and I'm sorry, this, this error that I mentioned that I, I uh, uh, stumbled on verbally before occurs here again. We really want, we want to head towards the theta equals pi ground state, but the logic is the same. We, uh, in this, we use this secondary Hamiltonian, which describes, so it's the low energy theory, if you like, which describes evolution in the approximate uh, degenerate manifold and uh, try to head towards the ground state. <clears throat> and uh, we st uh, studied this numerically. So I don't have analytic results to prepare, to, to uh, present, but we uh, studied this approach uh, numerically. And it's really intriguing because uh, although we could only uh, go up to a rather small number of bits uh, in trying to uh, uh, compute the behavior of a quantum computer classically we could only go up to 20 uh, you find that this algorithm uh, both for sparse graphs and for uh, dense graphs that, uh, that is for dense sparse and dense random graphs uh, behaves much better than, uh, than the classical algorithms at, at finding uh, close to maximal independent sets. And we have some understanding of why it works so well, which is uh, basically <laughs> of the form as, well, we know why the classical methods do poorly, and it doesn't apply to the quantum method. So why do the classical methods do poorly? Uh, this has been studied in considerable depth in the computing science literature. And the key is something called scatter, uh, shattering, which is basically a problem of uh, local minima, if you like. Uh, as you go to independent sets that are larger and larger, you find that the, ch the choices you've already made for which nodes to include uh, highly condition uh, which future choices you can make and still be independent. And uh, some of the choices will preclude you from solution, from finding solutions that are equally good because to get there, you'd have to undo the choices that you've already made and make completely different choices. So the, uh, the, the space of degenerate states, if you like, the, or the, the space of node choices that are uh, independent uh, sh shatters into these things that are separated and can't be reached by a step, can't be reached from one to another uh, in small steps, that is incrementally by considering how to improve one the, the result for one spin at a time or a few at a time. But the, the quantum algorithm uh, keeps, all the, keeps all of them in the wave function in principle. And, and so it has access to the whole space and it's not clear and doesn't seem to be true uh, numerically that the shattering uh, consideration applies. And in fact, it's not implausible uh, that if we, uh, uh, do this process slowly, uh, we don't feed a lot of energy into the system. And so it'll, uh, and again, also if we do it slowly, the system will tend to thermalize. Uh, and uh, if we've injected only a small amount of energy and the system thermalizes, it will overwhelmingly represent low energy states. <clears throat> okay. That's in a way a nice conceptual lead in to my final topic, which is cooling. <clears throat> uh, as we've seen, important computational problems can be cast into the physical question of getting close to the ground state 
of reasonably, although certainly deceptively, simple Hamiltonians. So they're reasonably simple in the sense that they involve only, uh, say, three body interactions. On the other hand, they don't have uh, uh, physical uh, uh, con constraints like locality, uh, especially locality, <laughs> that, uh, and, and that, 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 little, that little complication goes a long way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, a very, very simple remark is that one way to reach the ground state, if you want to suck energy out of something, is to put the system in contact with a zero temperature heat bath. What could be more natural? And that's the motivation of the constructions that follow. I will. Uh, follow this out in detail for the Grover problem and just give some where I think uh, I understand it and then uh, just give some little indications of how uh, it does or doesn't generalize to more uh, difficult problems. <clears throat> uh, let me emphasize that uh, putting in a bath with many, many bits that whose only function in life is to suck energy out of the system of interest uh, is way outside the uh, uh, traditional model of quantum computing. And so we shouldn't be surprised that we get, if we get uh, different answers, and, uh, big, and big improvements if we're adding resources without counting them in, in the uh, in the economics, so to speak, in the, in the price estimate. So we won't count bath qubits and we will allow a global magnetic field to act on all the spins and, uh, and cool it. So we're assuming cooling comes for free, basically. <clears throat> but it has to be done carefully because if you just suck out energy, or try to suck out energy in a uh, crude way, you're going to uh, upset the quantum computation that's going on uh, and maybe even introduce heat instead of, uh, instead of actually cooling. <clears throat> uh, that said, I would like to mention that I think that uh, this idea of having computational bits of one kind that should be a very high quality and that you want to address very carefully and uh, other bits that whose only role in life is to suck energy to get cold and then suck energy out of the computational bits has plausible uh, physical realizations. Uh, for instance, you could have uh, computation based on different kinds of impurity centers in diamond, nitrogen, and silicon, and use one of them as the computational medium and the other as the bath medium, because you could address them uh, separately. And uh, again, this is a mixed audience, but I'll say it that it's quite practical. People make a living by making spin systems very cold. <laughs> okay, so uh, cooling is a, in principle of, it is a notoriously uh, complicated problem in general. I mean, there are treatises on the foundations of statistical mechanics that don't answer the question, but uh, uh, it's a somewhat different question here because we're interested in cooling systems that are small, that are uh, already cold in some sense. We want we're putting them in a very particular state, uh, and and we and we want to accomplish particular things to get them to really really low temp really really low temperatures. So it's cooling not in the sense of uh, uh, refrigeration engineering, <laughs> typical refrigeration engineering, but a very special kind of cooling. <clears throat> uh, let me advertise briefly a book that I really like, Consistent Quantum Theory. And this little model is stolen <laughs> or taken from that book. Uh, it's a model for uh, 
if you like, it's, it was presented as a model for alpha decay, but is actually also a model of the simplest possible cooling process. We have an excited state, which is in the original instantiation of the model a nucleus. And then we have uh, a cooling apparatus, which in the original model is empty space, but uh, obviously could be a uh, material medium. Uh, the basis of states is the possible locations of the particles at all these sites. And the, the uh, evolution is discrete in time and simply moves you along from lower to higher numbers by one unit, except at uh, the special locations uh, zero and one, where you have a unitary matrix that allows transitions uh, from site zero to site one, but also allows uh, a particle at site zero to stay where it is. And uh, if its amplitude for staying where it is is very large, so its alpha is close to one, then this can mimic a decay process very nicely. And it emb embodies basic principles of superposition, having a quantum having a quantum description and unitarity and so forth. So it's a very nice kind of model for analyzing the uh, consistency of cooling schemes with basic principles of quantum mechanics. And uh, it's nice to work out that this gives a convincing account of what goes on quantum mechanically in uh, beta decay process. Uh, the particle has uh, the possibility of right away uh, jumping to, uh, to, to from zero to one, and then it has to keep going. So that's amplitude beta to go to state n. Uh, uh, and then it can wait once and then jump and so forth. So it's, it's clear that this is the evolution and it has exponential decay with an explicit radiation field. So all, all makes sense. <clears throat> uh, now we can interpret this particle more abstractly as an excitation and then it becomes a model of cooling irreversibility. Okay, we've excited, we excite the state and then uh, it uh, goes into a, an unexcited state, dumping its energy into the bath, which is in this, which was empty space, but could have been a medium, too. <clears throat> now, with that kind of understanding in mind, let's return to the Gover problem. Uh, we can let the mystery state be all spins up, just for ease of notation, uh, and to think of something concrete. Uh, as long as we don't use any special property of that state. So uh, we'll, we'll show how to reach, how you reach the mystery state one, uh, but the, the uh, symmetry of the way the different up and down possibilities are treated will ensure that whatever the mystery state is, this uh, same strategy would apply. <clears throat> okay, so we want, we we'll couple every single one of the spins to uh, two uh, baths, actually, two separate baths, uh, one of which uh, flips, takes the coupling, is a, is a coupling which is designed to set the spin to up, and the other of which is designed to set the spin to down. And, uh, we'll have the dynamics say that these only occur if they conserve energy. That's not uh, built into this kind of energy conservation is not built into this kind of model, but uh, if we uh, build that in by hand, it's very reasonable. And, uh, and you, one can show that, that underlying microscopic models essentially uh, give this same behavior. <clears throat> so then uh, in our Grover problem, we remember we started with this universal state and now we want to cool it 
so that it uh, becomes the state with all the spins up. We'll have all the bath spins point down, although either one would be fine. Again, uh, either choice is conventional, but we, we want the bath spins to all point down in the lowest energy state. And then we want the bath's interaction to absorb the penalty energy delta that uh, is available when you go from an incorrect state to uh, the ground state of the Grover problem. <clears throat> Now, the cooling, this cooling construction, if we apply it to each spin separately, uh, will allow states which differ from the target state in one entry to get there because they will gain energy, gain the energy delta by flipping one spin. So, for instance, suppose that we want to have a list of n items, our target state is all up. We start with the universal state. Then after one stage of cooling, we've uh, taken all the states that were wrong in only one place and mapped them onto the ground state because they could give up their energy to get to the ground state. So things that were wrong in two places are unaffected. Nothing has happened to them. but the ones that were wrong in only one place have cooled to the ground state. Now we use the other trick <laughs> that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so we, we, have, uh, we have a state, the, the remainder, because the ground state is the ground state, we'll just leave it alone. Uh, and, it's split off, so we don't have to concern ourselves with it. It can't lose any more energy. It's already lost. Uh, now we have, um, but we have the degenerate manifold, in a, but we're in a bad place within the degenerate manifold because we've, uh, we've corrected the single bit errors, so to speak. Uh, and that's all that cooling one spin at a time can do. But now using non-abelian holonomy, we can stir up, uh, with that degenerate manifold so that uh, it gets mixed and the, uh, the states that were wrong in only one place get represented fully again. So we go through a cooling stage, then a mixing stage, and then we can do cooling again and fix some more errors or reduce the amplitude of the wrong part of the wave function, if you like. And then we can rinse, lather, repeat, do it several times. And here's what happens. Each time we decrease the amplitude of wrongness, uh, we reduce the amplitude of uh, the part of the wave function or density matrix that's not in the ground state. Uh, basically, we uh, are fixing one spin at a time so uh, each time we reduce the amplitude of the wrong thing by one minus one over n, where n is log to base two of big N, the number of items in the list, uh, and we do it p times, and so we get approximately e to the minus p over n after p cycles. Whoops. So, for example, if we take P to be proportional to N, we reduce by a finite fraction, and we have an enhanced probability of uh, getting the right answer. If we uh, uh, do it a time proportional to log to uh, N squared, then we, uh, we reduce the wrongness by a power and we can uh, in logarithmic time or power of logarithm get the uh, wrongness factor quite small. So this is a very good result, I think. It's correct. It's, uh, 
it's you can do much better than square root of n by changing the nature of the, of the, the resources. Uh, the special structure of the Grover problem, which allows incre incremental improvements, was essential to this approach because we fixed one spin at a time. It would not apply to shattered problems or to general satisfaction problems. Uh, and in more general hard problems, uh, we have to have more sophisticated cooling schemes. This is definitely work for the future. Uh, we won't be able to, to uh, uh, allow energy gains which change many, many spins at a time because they're many, they're, we face a combinatorial explosion. So we can't do that directly. We have to worry, we have to uh, uh, hope that the feedback from the bath will in, in, in effect introduce many body couplings and uh, allow those kinds of uh, collective transitions to occur uh, in order to do the last stages of, to get to really, really low temperatures. Uh, this raises very difficult questions and uh, I have only uh, very qualitative ideas about it at present, but it seems to be, seems to me to be a very, very important problem. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let me summarize and conclude very swiftly. Uh, the point is that physical processes can provide resources for computation that don't necessarily fit naturally into the abstract circuit gate model. Uh, the field seems to be, well, not entirely, but uh, in many branches uh, of, invest of, of the community, uh, settling into an abstract circuit gate problem that uh, may not reflect the uh, appropriate uh, input of resources uh, to, uh, to this domain. There might be other resources that go beyond that model. And uh, maybe at least, in, and certainly in, at least in these uh, restricted examples, we can demonstrably put those resources to good use. Okay, with that, I'll, uh, I'll end. Thank you for your attention and uh, be happy to take questions. Oh, sorry, I was muting myself. Thank you very much, Professor Frank Wilcher, for the wonderful lecture. So, uh, any question from the audience? If you have, you can just unmute yourself. Um, maybe a quick question. Um, it was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Um, do you see potentials for exponential speed ups in this framework? Just super root well, Yeah, I mean, there was an exponential. exponential. There was an exponential speed up in the Grover problem. If if you just count uh, uh, computational qubits and time, if you don't count the cost of uh, setting up the uh, the bath, and uh, then uh, we were getting a very good, we were getting essentially arbitrarily good uh, success rates uh, with a time that's polynomially, polynomial in the logarithm of n. So it's essentially, uh, yeah, it is exp it's exponential <laughs> in that sense. Yeah. But you don't see those two steps of the heat bath and so on as a barrier of some sort, right? Come again? You don't see the, those two steps you just mentioned, the heat bath uh, and the setup as a barrier, as a, well, as a barrier. that remains to be seen. I mean, but I think people should start thinking about uh, using heat baths, which are a resource that are, is available, and certainly in spin systems, uh, to use them to get to the ground state. <laughs>
I mean, what could be simpler than the idea that uh, to make something cold, you put it on a piece of ice? That's uh, that's what. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, but but you know, I mean, to normalize things, it could be it could be a tremendous engineering problem to do it properly in a way that's helpful. Is uh, you know, I th I thought anions would be discovered within a few months of the the original uh, theoretical proposal and. It's taken almost 40 years, so I, I, can't, I don't know. It's very hard to know how these engineering projects will work. We're still waiting for fusion control. But, <laughs> but this is an entirely new way of doing things. I mean, the, the way you, you stated, of course, sounds humorously simplistic, but indeed, yeah. what has been the barrier? I mean, people have thought about this. What is, what is the barrier from... Of, well, uh, yeah. yeah, the barrier is uh, if you couple to a heat bath too strongly, uh, the Hamiltonian that covers your system is different from the Hamiltonian you thought you had. And so the possibility of making mistakes is very serious. And the possibility of uh, upsetting the delicate quantum mechanical nature of the computational part is very serious. So mm -hmm. that that's the reason. And pe people have nibbled around the edges of this uh, concept, I think. I don't, and I can't guarantee that there's no, no hint in the literature of uh, uh, the generality of this approach, but uh, it's, it, to me, it appears uh, like a, an unexploited possibility or not sufficiently exploited possibility. Really intriguing. <clears throat> Yeah, all these, you know, all these considerations have a, a very basic message, which is, I think it may be premature to uh, focus exclusively on the circuit model. You really should be thinking about physical embodiments. And there's still, you know, the, the, since uh, physical embodiments that, that have, uh, different uh, costs and benefits. So these, these, of course, don't necessarily replace the circuit model, but they could supplement it. Any other questions, comments? I have a naive one. So uh, the usual, like maybe no topological side of topological quantum computation require really yeah. temperature to implement. Yeah. And it, I mean, the usual like topological quantum computation require much more, more lower temperature. Yes. I wonder, is there some estimation on the kind of uh, thermal environment, the temperature required for the setup you need? Well, is that yeah. much, more, much more suitable economic, economically uh, Small, convenient for engineer. <laughs> yeah, well, temperature uh, range. So if uh, if if the temperature scale involved in your computational bits is already small, then it might be difficult to cool it. Even small, you know, small on that scale might be uh, an engineering challenge. That's even more difficult than it would be in then to take heat out of a system that has uh you know a serious gap and uh and um, a higher energy scale uh but i don't think it's necessarily true by the way that uh quantum computing will always be at very low temperatures i mean it's certainly required for anions in the quantum hall state and also for instantiations uh, which use superconductivity in a serious way, at least if you're using conventional superconductors. Uh, but uh, the people have talked about, although I don't think it's matured, uh, topological systems with much larger energy scales. So uh, spin liquids based on charge instead of uh, 
instead of spin, for instance, or uh, um, so with di you know based based on spin uh, charge dipoles instead of spins, uh, or uh, uh, churn insulators, or you know think, uh, which can have quantum hall like properties without necessarily being at super low temperatures or in high magnetic fields. Uh, so, you know, it, it emphasizes the importance also on the condensed matter material side of, if you want to do quant, if you want to do topological quantum computing, certainly if you want to take care, if you want to exploit cooling on top of that, uh, you probably want to move to platforms eventually that aren't characterized by exceedingly low energy scales. <clears throat> yeah. and, um, but in summary, do you require, do you think you require less or maybe your, 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 your constraint on the temperature will be less compared to <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't want to speculate. Okay. No, uh, no problem. No. All right. Any question, comments from audience? Uh, please feel free. Yeah. Okay. We, we're way over time, so. <laughs> oh, no worry. Yeah. So, if there are no more questions, in any case, that's thanks, uh, Professor Welchek, for the wonderful lecture again. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. Yeah, you can probably. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I'm easy to reach if you have questions yeah. offline. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah. So long.